you've heard of swinging and open marriages, well, on today's episode, Dr. Alan Hawkins joins us to discuss consensual non-monogamy. He shares what we know from the research about open marriages, including many of the risks and pitfalls. And he shares some great tips for strengthening your marriage as well. Dr. Alan Hawkins is the manager of the Utah Marriage Commission. He recently retired after 33 years as a professor at Brigham Young University. He earned a PhD in Human Development and Family Studies at Pennsylvania State University in 1990. Professor Hawkins' scholarship and outreach efforts focused on educational interventions and policies to help couples form and sustain healthy marriages and relationships, and to help fathers be engaged in the lives of their children. Since 2000, he's been intricately involved in state and federal policy efforts to support relationship education programs for disadvantaged families. He has served on the Utah Marriage Commission since 2004 and is a past chair of the Utah Marriage Commission. He currently serves as vice chair on the board for the National Association for Relationship and Marriage Education. We hope you enjoy the show. Hey friends, welcome to another episode of the Stronger Marriage Connection. I'm Dr. Dave here at Utah State University alongside our, our co-host, Dr. Liz Hale, our licensed clinical psychologist. We are dedicating our life's work to bring you the best research and resources, some tips and some tools to help you create the marriage of your dreams. All right. I think today's topic is an interesting one for sure. We're talking about a term and a relationship that is increasing in popularity, especially among younger generations. It's called consensual non-monogamy in marriage. And here to discuss this topic is our own expert and family scholar here with Utah Marriage Commission, Dr. Alan Hawkins. Welcome to the Stronger Marriage Connection podcast. Thanks. So, all right, Alan, <laughs> it's been around for a long time, but the term consensual non-monogamy, it's pretty new to me, at least. I've heard about um, swinging. I've heard about open marriages. So can you explain exactly what non-consent or consensual non-monogamy is and, and isn't? Yeah, uh, consensual non-monogamy is uh, at its heart a mutual agreement between in, with a, in a committed couple just to open up the relationship romantically and sexually. But it takes on a lot of different forms. Um, and I think that's where it can be confusing. Um, for some, you know, it's, it's, uh, a couple just going out together to a swinging party and they have sex with someone else at the party and then they go home. Um, and, uh, so you've heard about that. That's been around ever, you know, since the sexual revolution. Um, the, a more complicated form they call polyamory. Uh, and that's, um, that's a set of three or more people, uh, kind of in a, what we might call a sexual system or a sexual pod, each having, um, sexual relationships with, um, each other, um, in that system. And, um, but they probably will draw a boundary a sexual and a romantic boundary around the system. So it stays within the system, not going outside uh, of the system. And um, they often live together. Uh, and this is in the press a lot these days. It gets a lot of press. Uh, bisexuals are sometimes more attracted to this kind of consensual non-monogamy so that they can satisfy their sexual desires for both uh, men and women. But polyamory isn't the most common form. It's, it's, it's a relatively uncommon. It's very complex a uh, system as you can imagine. The most common form is what, uh, you mentioned was just called an open relationship where a couple agrees that they can have romantic and sexual relationships with others outside of their primary relationship. Um, but they don't share partners, uh, with each other. And, um, and they probably don't live together. Um, this kind in an open, uh, relationship, uh, they will usually have rules, sometimes very precise and a lot of rules about what they can and can't do. Um, um, although, you know, every couple would have different rules and the rules, um, uh, as you can imagine, sometimes get broken and have to be renegotiated uh, on that kind of thing. So that's the more common 
uh, way that it's practiced. The important thing, again, though, is that there's just a lot of variation. These are just labels. Um, but uh, people do consensual non-monogamy in a lot of different ways and change and go back and forth, and um, including, by the way, deciding to stop uh, this and go back to old-fashioned monogamy. Um, and uh, although the research on this isn't really um, very clear yet, it looks like this, these kinds of relationships are not very stable over time. Um, so, I mean, that's uh, that. one thing to point out, though. I'm, um, those who are involved with consensual non-monogamy, especially those who advocate for it, draw a red line, a bright line between uh, this and uh, polygamy. What we think about is the old fashioned polygamy um, that has a very particular gender structure to it. Um, uh, consensual non-monogamy is almost by de definition unstructured and, um, and, and, uh, you know, uh, I, I suppose there's an argument to be made, but most, uh, want to be very clear that this is not the old fashioned polygamy. Mm -hmm. Man, I can't help but think we're playing with fire with this one. Liz, I'm, I'm just curious in your private practice, do you see this come up much? Not much, but it has definitely been there. You know, I started to think in these last 33 years, I counted about a dozen couples. So it's not very many. I'm a very small sample. Um, my biggest concern is it never ends well. You know, it works until it doesn't. And there's always a, a doesn't, it seems like. And in the meantime, there's just a great deal of damage that's caused. Most couples don't recover. I went back and, uh, and asked my two more recent couples just how they're doing, checking in. One has since divorced. Uh, another couple stopped with the open relationships, a third party, I should say. And they're in recovery mode, struggling. Uh, so we shall see what happens. So I hear about it. I hear of parties and groups and clubs where people do meet. And it's quite open. The idea is hip. And a lot of my couples will say it's really fun initially. You know, one couple in particular, they started out by really just socializing with two of their good friends, another couple. And before the night was over, the two women were kissing and it was kind of a turn on to the men. And sadly, what this one husband said to me is it was just a slippery slope. It was just the beginning. And it was like a drug. I just couldn't get enough. So then we started, you know, going out there, meeting other couples and really taking greater risks. So I see it. I don't see it a lot. And I wonder also, as we're talking, Ellen and, and Dave, I'm wondering how many couples didn't ever bring it up also. So there's a lot of shame attached to this, sadly. They're, they're careful about who knows, most people. Do those couples come to you in recovery mode or do they come to you seeking help to make it work or, or do you get both? It's a little bit of a side note. We're, we're wanting to work on our marriage. We're struggling. And oh, then by the way, there is this, we are involved in polyamory. <laughs> it seldom, seldom is it really the issue. It becomes kind of the issue, it becomes a big deal because trust is a huge part of this. And it's, it's hard, you know, to find two people and then another two people that feel exactly the same way. If you, if I'm clear, you know, that there would be this connection in uh, this four way connection, I guess. Uh, so, Alan, I'd love to know what you found out. How common is consensual non monogamy? What does the research suggest? Yeah. Um, you know, first of all, let me say that I like to focus more on consensual monogamy in marriage. Uh, because I think it gets at the very heart of the meaning of marriage. And so I'm a little, I, I, uh, around, around non-marital relationships, I, I don't get um, as uh, involved in researching this. But I have done some research on this. And what I've found, and uh, others as well, is that only about 1% of married couples at any time are engaged in some kind of consensual non-monogamy. Um, although about 4% will say that at some time uh, they've tried this, they've done it, but are not doing it now. They, they dabbled, but they didn't stay, huh? Yeah. Uh, they dabbled, they fell into it, they, they, there was something, um, uh, but not now. Uh, now. So it's uncommon statistically. On the other hand, 1% 
means uh, 600,000 married couples in uh, in the United States at this time. So it's it's not nothing. Um, and a couple of million who have done it at some point. Um, so now, and it's hard to know if there's really a trend in this, but we suspect that there is uh, because attitudes are changing. As you mentioned earlier, Dave, um, younger Americans are um, are much more open to open relationships. Uh, some research indicating 40 to 50 percent of younger Americans saying it's okay and indicating some level of interest. Now, among married couples, younger couples, that interest is lower. The research tends to say um, about a quarter. Um, and maybe not surprisingly, about 30% of men, about 20% of married women uh, have expressed, younger uh, married couples have expressed some acceptance and interest in it. It doesn't mean that they're doing it, but um, are a little bit more open to it. Not surprisingly, men more so than women. And also we know that uh, bisexuals and that um, uh, bisexual men and women and homosexual men are also much more open to it and more likely uh, to be involved with it. So that's kind of what the research says uh, about in terms of the, of the numbers. Mm. I'm curious, um, Alan, with the, with the research with this, if you know, um, I don't know if you call it success rate or, or kind of the end. How do, how do things end? Uh, I can't see things ending very well most of the time. Do you know as, as far as um, how, how they last? Um, we don't have really good research on that. Um, you know, to, to ask that question, you have to follow um, these couples over time. And there's very little of what researchers call longitudinal research that tracks them over time. Just as important, though, there's a big uh, kind of hole in the research so far. And that's because um, we're only we only interview and talk to and survey those who are doing it now. We have not um, I'm not aware of any research where they have focused on those who have uh, been in it, but are not in it now. And so it's kind of hard to tell what the course of that relationship is when our focus is just a snapshot in time of how's it going right now. And of course, this research is almost always done with volunteer samples and who volunteers for it. So uh, research wise, it's, it's, it's a tough nut to crack um, to, to get to um, everyone's experience with it. And probably not surprisingly, those who are willing to talk about it are probably in that uh, stage of the relationship where they think it's working and they're very satisfied with things. And indeed, most of the research that is done with those individuals suggests that, um, you know, uh, that those who are married couples are, are just as satisfied, if not more satisfied with their relationship. But I think there's some real holes. Uh, in that research. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, it gets tricky. I can think of all kinds of potential challenges to making this work and keeping a strong marriage connection. What are the challenges you see and what does the research show that makes this difficult to work, Alan? Yeah. And interestingly enough, it's not the researchers, it's the popular writers out there uh, and that are, and are willing to talk about the problems and challenges. Um, usually still quite positive, put a shine on it, but uh, are willing to talk openly about the challenges. And so, um, I mean, I could, I could go on for several hours, uh, about that, but let me, let me focus on, I think, just three or four things that I think are that, that, um, people should be thinking about if, uh, if they're thinking about consensual non-monogamy, you know, in the literature, um, on uh, this form of a relationship. The core is open and honest communication. Uh, they talk about that, how much it is needed in these circumstances, how, how important it is. Um, but we know that precious few of us are really communication superstars. Um, most of us are pretty average um, with our skills when it comes to discussing sensitive and emotional topics and difficult topics like this. So I think it's a pretty small number of people 
that have those um, communication and problem solving skills to be able to really work through uh, all of these issues, including jealousy. It's not like jealousy gets suspended in these relationships. They can be um, that jealousy can be there. And, and you need those strong communication skills. And, and we know that that's something that people uh, struggle with. So, um, th- there's one point. Um, it really challenges your ability to communicate, um, with each other and to solve, uh, those problems. And I'm sure you've seen some of those couples in your practice over time, Liz, where they, they really haven't been able, uh, to talk, um, openly and honestly with each other. And in that same way, I think consensual non-monogamy takes a really high level of emotional awareness and emotional self-regulation. Now, maybe people will disagree with me with that, that, you know, that, that we're, we're, we're kind of uh, calling it, um, that that's not the right term to use there. But when we're dealing with these kinds of issues that would come up in sharing our sexual lives with others and doing it openly, um, uh, I think it takes a really high level of emotional seg- self-regulation. And most of us are in that pretty normal, that, you know, range of what we can do, um, emotionally and uh, taking on, uh, sexuality. I mean, it's so raw. Um, and, um, and, uh, and just this is really hard for us to deal with emotionally. So. Um, that's another one where I think you should anticipate having real challenges. But, but, you know, those are the big one. I mean, maybe we shouldn't even go there. Maybe we start with what's the biggest one in my mind. And that's just time. I mean, who has the time? Um, we're so busy. Our relationships are demanding enough as it is. And we don't give them, you know, the amount of time to nurture them that they really need. And when we divide that up, that time up, I think that's probably the number one challenge is just how do we find the time for this? Um, and do you really have the communication skills to deal with? No, I'm going to be spending time with her tonight, not you. Um, and, um, you know, the challenges of managing uh, that. Uh, and maybe it's not just with one. Maybe it's uh, with others uh, as well. So. Uh, think about that element uh, to it and, and how that would be so challenging. But I want to mention just one other thing that I think uh, is overlooked in the academic and in the popular uh, popular literature on this uh, phenomenon. They um, they use the word consensual non-monogamy. They stress that, but w- they don't stop to, to think about it very much. Um, I think there's reason to question how consensual consensual is in some of these relationships. In my own research, I've asked couples um, who are doing uh, consensual non-monogamy, who wanted it more, you, your partner, or was it mutual? Um, And um, about 60% of heterosexual married women said their husband wanted it more. And about 50% of heterosexual married men say their wife wanted it more. And so I think there's something going on here. There's something out of whack. Um, uh, I think the word consensual needs to be kind of be put in quotation marks and not assume that just because you say the word, um, it accurately describes the phenomenon. How mutual is it if you've got an adventurous, good-looking married man um, with a, a frazzled stay at home wife. And he says, honey, I want to open up the relationship. Um, uh, kind of implying the, and if you don't, well, maybe I'm out of here. How consensual, uh, is that? I've thought, I've thought about that even just recently with a couple that came in and all of a sudden he, he brought up this idea. I would, I think I'd like to do this. And it almost felt, you know, the term exit affairs when, a person has an affair as a way of getting out. Uh, it, it almost felt like that. So it's interesting you should bring that up, Alan. We'll be right back after this brief message. Hey. 
And we're back. Well, let's dive right in. I just wonder, I wonder about the variety of needs. We're so complicated as people. I think uh, there, there is this garden variety of why we do what we do, right? Why we look for that excitement. I have yet to see it work for a long-term thriving marriage. And there's, always, there's just always a point where the newness wears off. Right. One partner doesn't keep the agreement, like you said, the agreement. Right. What was consensual and that was that whatever was established prior to entering this third party relationship. And it just crushes the heart of the other party. Well, and one thing we know, too, Liz, is that one form of consensual non-monogamy is where one partner, usually she, the wife, agrees that her husband can do that, but she doesn't have any interest in it. So exhausting emotionally and physically and time and and just um but she says yeah you Don't go ahead that. i'm not going to no and again so how consensual how equal then uh is that and i have not seen that you know go very well either it's just a matter of time before that marriage really kind of hurts, hits the dirt, if you will. But again, my sample is tiny, but I really appreciate you, Dave and I both do, Alan, of, of kind of ringing this alarm bell of the information that's out there and how it's rather titillating and even encouraged and uh, justified. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Alan, I'm, I'm guessing that those in favor of this light lifestyle are saying right now, you know, why, why worry about this? Why even give this issue a, attention? What people do in private, you know, it, hey, it doesn't, it doesn't affect others. Just leave me alone and, and let me do what I want. How do you respond to, to that type of a reaction? And let me respond to that as well as to one other comment I hear from people who, um, would not uh, be supportive of, uh, this kind of relationship at all. But they say, don't give it light. Don't let it out. You know, don't, don't give it the press. Mm -hmm. um, too late. Which I want. <laughs> Well, right. And that, my response to that is it's too late. It's out there. And we seem to be going through a time right now, the last few months, where it, there's something in a, in a large media outlet almost every week uh, on this and usually uh, shining a, um, a pretty uh, nice, soft, bright spotlight on it. Um, so I think in that sense, it's too late. But for those who say um, what what we do in private uh, doesn't um, you know, is, is our business. It's nobody else's business. Well, actually, I disagree with that. I don't think it's a private thing. There are people now who are advocating for this lifestyle and advocating for a change to the meaning of marriage. There's a public movement um, to make consensual non-monogamy more acceptable in society and even to give it uh, some kind of legal recognition uh, as well. So um, th there's that element, but even if there weren't, um, the uh, I think the push for that recognition and acceptance means um, that we're trying to privatize the decision um, around monogamy. Um, but what I mean by that is we're challenging the norm of monogamy. Um, uh, it's, so it's not just about what I want to do in my private life, but uh, as a society, um, challenging the norm that monogamy is um, uh, a, a rule, a hard rule uh, for marriage. No, we all get to choose that. And what that means then uh, is that uh, it doesn't just affect those who, who make the private decision. It reduces the expectation of monogamy for everyone. It reduces your power to say no when somebody asks, um, say, let's open it up. You have to ask for monogamy. You have to negotiate it. Um, and, uh, and so that brings in much more uh, power into the relationship as well, as opposed to there's a rule. Um, this is the rules you agree to when you enter into this institution. And so to me, it changes it. Uh, it's trying to change the meaning of marriage and the, those norms around it. And in that way, I think it is not just private. It becomes a very public kind of thing. Ellen, I've learned from my couples who have explored these outside relationships. There are a handful of books and websites about the how-tos of non-monogamy. But what about the literature warning couples about the debilitating effects of these practices? What do you see? Yeah, and unfortunately, that, I think that's one of the reasons why I wanted to do um, uh, this podcast is that 
Uh, there, yes, there are a lot of books and websites out there on how to do it. If that's what you want to do and how to do it, and some even referring to it as ethical non-monogamy, how to do it ethically. Um, and, um, yeah, if you're going to do it, I'd prefer you do it ethically than non-ethically. But uh, there isn't, I don't, th I have not seen a lot of help out there for those who are thinking about this, who've been asked about it. Um, you know, what do you do? And uh, I do think that we need more help. Uh, for individuals out there who are thinking about it, um, to help them think a little bit more clearly, a little bit more honestly, if you will, about uh, what's involved uh, with it. And so I'm, I'm, anyway, I'm hoping that uh, this podcast can at least be one source um, for those who are in this, that situation. Hmm. Yeah, I, I just feel like as, as we talk about this, um, almost flipping that script a little bit and saying, you know what? What are the joys of of monogamy? You know, what is it that, that goes into hey staying together with this with this one? Uh, for me, as I think about that, Alan and Liz, it's it's this. I don't have this this worry or this fear. Hey, you know, we agreed that you would do this, and she's out with someone else. It's just um, yeah, it blows my mind honestly. So it's this comfort of this trust, this commitment, this foundation of we're committed to each other. We made promises, even covenants with each other. To, to be true to each other and to work on building us, us two and, and our family. Um, just feels like, and then on the flip side, I feel like the risks are just way, I'm not, I'm not a big risk taker, but it just feels like the risks are way too high for this like thimble full of pleasure and joy for this like lifetime of, of real happiness and peace. And so I, it's hard for me to really see the, the other perspective in this kind of excitement, pleasure, centered world to get caught up in this and and lose control just go way too fast and getting burned by this fire yeah and we haven't even talked about um what are my children seeing and am i okay uh with that uh, is that what i want my children and and we haven't talked about managing uh, other extended family relationships with this so when mom and dad know i'm doing this how do they react and what does that mean and how does this affect my siblings and you know, and that, um, and so I think you're right, Dave. That that risk uh, to reward re, uh, ratio um, is is easy, you know, to underestimate underest uh, um, for people who are thinking about this. The other, the other bird is the secrecy. Not a lot of couples are open with their extended family or their children. It's this big dark secret, and that is just a weight for couples to keep up. And kids are pretty savvy, you know, especially a little bit older kids. You'll see their Eyebrows raised, like, what is going on here? They're, they're learning this information. They can put two and two together. So please, let's not fool ourselves, right, to thinking that we are getting away with this. Or if your parents see you hanging out with another couple an awful lot, it's like, what is happening? So I think it's very hard to, uh, to live in secret. We try, a lot of couples try, but I don't think we get away with, not nearly to the extent that we think we do. And the popular literature on consensual non-monogamy um, does let some of its warts out. And one of those warts is, is that people cheat within consensual non-monogamy. They've established some rules, but they break those rules. And they don't um, come clean uh, about them. And uh, maybe that's when you get... Yeah, so sorry, Alan. It becomes that slippery slope almost, doesn't it? Uh, it almost said it, you know, the fact that you've opened things up almost then says, well, I don't need to tell my partner about everyone. Um, and, uh, and so, uh, consensual and open and, um, you know, um, yeah, but I, that it's not any kind of, uh, guarantee, um, that you're going to stay within the bounds that you set. Yeah. And, and I think like listeners who maybe, you know, think or know somebody or thinking about this, it, it appears like many things. It's, it's just exciting and it probably is exciting at first and there's pleasure and fun. And, and then, but what I don't feel like people see is the, the heartache, the pain, the regret, the shame, the, the years of therapy of trying to mend, um, what they what they once had that that's not on tv that's not the glamorous part of that right right mm. 
Whew, what a what a wild wild talk topic um, that we're talking about today with this um, yeah, consensual non monogamy. Um, Alan, can I ask you where is there resources um, that you're aware of as where people can go for for more information? Uh, you know, research based good information about this. Yeah, you know, I, again, I wish I could say that I I have a go to source um, uh, for those. There's um, uh, I, I just don't, I, I, if there is, I haven't found it. Um, there might be, um, people who've kind of done their own personal, um, blog around it. There probably are some of those, uh, but a go-to website, a go-to book. Um, and, um, and, uh, you know, I hesitate almost to do this, but I'm going to be brave. Um, I think the field of relationship experts have got to get, um, back out of the corner and out of the closet, if you will. I know a number of people um, who I think would share many of the views that we've talked about, but have hold back. Um, they're, they're kind of self-silencing themselves. I would like to see some of the more prominent relationship experts out there um, uh, come clean on this. And, um, and maybe they'll take a less uh, kind of um, value-oriented position than I have taken. Um, but um, uh, I, I want them to come out and talk about the real challenges uh, that are involved in uh, taking on this kind of relationship, especially um, for married couples. Uh, and uh, so let me let me, uh, uh, you know, send that challenge to the field. Mm -hmm. I think even Alan, uh, and I'll remind our listeners of the stronger marriage dot org uh, listeners know this is a, a podcast put out by the Utah Marriage Commission. We're part of the Utah Marriage Commission providing resources and, and research, as much research as there is. But I think we'll we'll aim to put some information, what we do know on some of these um, the studies and the things that uh, Dr. Ellen Hawkins is talking about today. We'll see if we can find a place somewhere on the Stronger Marriage um, website for, for listeners to go, at least as, as a starting point, don't you think, Alan? Yeah, we could do that. Great. Um, Alan, one of the questions we'd like to ask all of our, our guests is this. In your mind, what is the key to a stronger marriage connection? Well, yeah, my mind is, uh, is right here right now in this consensual non-monogamy. And, and so uh, let, me, let me just say be all in for each other. Uh, I think that's why consensual non-monogamy worries me because um, – um, you know, it becomes more public and more young people are, are thinking about it. And, and we, you know, we talk about being all in at work and all in in other contexts, you know, leaning in. Lean, um, but uh, consensual non-monogamy um, is saying marriage doesn't need to be all in, at least not in, in our romantic and sexual feelings. And, um, you know, uh, ask, you know, monogamy uh, is asking too much. Uh, it's too hard. It puts too much pressure on the relationship. They talk very openly about that. Take, making, taking that expectation off um, frees you up and can actually um, strengthen your marriage. I, I think, I think that's a wild shot. Um, I think uh, being all in for each other is the way to go. Don't divide yourself. Um, you know, there's the argument. Uh, you love more than one child as a parent, you can love more than one person as a spouse. Um, and I think that's an incredibly risky way. To me, uh, I believe marriage is a relation that, relationship that asks you to give your all to each other, mentally, emotionally, sexually. Give your all to another person. Um, I think that kind of depth in a relationship leads to a richness and a beauty and a power that you can't achieve by dividing your heart um, among uh, others. I think there's incredible joy in the depth that comes with monogamy. And I think that's what the purpose of monogamy is, is to say, I'm all in with you and my heart is not at all divided. And I think it's what the vast of people really want, though sometimes, yeah, they get a little bit um, uh, tempted by uh, some of the other possibilities out there. And so I say, uh, go for it. Go all in. Um, 
rather than dividing yourself. That's my um, tip for a stronger marriage connection. Oh man, love that, Alan. Go deeper with one person instead of broader with yeah with others. Yeah. And yeah, of course, to do that effectively over time, you gotta what I call fight the entropy. You know, systems fall apart over time. That's the law of the universe, unless you put energy into them. And so when it's going a little bit stale and feels a little bit stuck, yeah, go deeper into the relationship. Don't go broader, uh, trying to find it uh, elsewhere. You know, work on the relationship uh, and get some help um, if you feel like it really, uh, really needs it. Um, uh, you know, that, that that's where I am. Doctors John and Julie Gottman, they, they write a fair amount about this with their love map, right? Getting to know your partner again, because we're always changing. One of my favorite tools to give couples is a free app on their phones called the Gottman Card Deck, 14 stacks of these cards. And it's really getting to know someone again, because we, again, we are all shifting and growing. Sometimes we're growing apart. So how can we have the excitement in the marriage instead of bringing somebody else in and just complicate it? You're so deep that, you know, you haven't gotten uh, to the bottom. And one of the things that's certainly been my experience is the deeper you get, the more you understand, which then means the more you love. You know, um, it, it's not the shallow, the one night stands in consensual non-monogamy or even the, the fun, romantic, um, uh, you know, uh, flings uh, that you have. Uh, it's pretty, it, there's a lot more depth uh, in people, and we ke- keep keep going in that direction. Yeah. Oh, man. Oh, I love this. We talked about uh, so much today. We like to wrap up by really asking you, um, is there a take-home message, something you want listeners to remember? We call it our, our takeaway of the day. Do you have a takeaway of the day for our listeners today? Uh, I mean, it's just don't get seduced into thinking that you need to look outside your marriage for your deepest desires. Um, they're, they're there. Um, uh, you, you may need to work on them. You may, may, may need to kind of revive things, um, but they're there. And um, so, uh, you know, that's really what I would say. Uh, just uh, look for your deepest desires within, not without. Yeah, love it. Liz, uh, what's your takeaway of the day? You know, I love how Alan says, you know, the justification is, gosh, you can, you love one more than one child. Can't you, we just love more than one romantic partner. My takeaway is how much we, we excuse this, um, non-monogamy relationships with the word love. It seems like we're just giving it an okay, but I love him, but I love them. I love her, right? If, if, if we love them, then somehow it is less damaging. And one of my other clients, um, he said to me, I thought he was so wise. He's, he's Christian and after the divorce and things going south for this, for them, uh, and his wife falling in love with one of the other parties, he said, you know what? I don't, I don't think God created us this way. I think he created us to love one person. And that's why our marriage fell apart. She, she couldn't love me, but she loved this other person. And that's why she's with him. I thought that was a very interesting insight that maybe we are really just created to love one person partner. Yeah. Hmm. What about you, Dave? What's your biggest takeaway with Alan bringing this very tender but important topic to our podcast today? Yeah, this this is an important one. I'm, I'm glad that we're talking about this. Alan, you mentioned something that really struck a chord with me, and that's um, the key to a stronger marriage connection. I love the concept of, of going all in um, in our relationships. I've, I've said before on the podcast, Lack of attention leads to loss of connection and specifically giving your spouse or partner your all in attention. Um, because I think that's one of the greatest gifts, right? It used to be time, you know, give your spouse your time, but I feel like attention is even more important. That means I'm, I'm dialed in on you and I don't have one foot in the boat and one foot on the shore. I, I've got some attention here, but man, I'm kind of flirting around and looking at other options. When I give my all in attention to, to one person, um, I feel like then that I, that that connection, that emotional. I love Alan how you talk about deep because the longer we've been married more than twenty five years now, we're going deeper and deeper into this, and the the emotional intimacy is what becomes very beautiful for us. That deep connection, um, and I, I really feel like it, uh, it it's from the attention. 
And that com- that complete trust of another person, complete giving uh, to another person, it's it's um, yeah, it's really powerful. It is, yeah, and peaceful. I would add peaceful. I, I don't. There's no worry. There's no none of this fear when I know that we're both all in. Yeah, it's it's a it's a great feeling. Wow. Um, Alan Hawkins, Dr. Alan Hawkins, thank you so much for joining us today, talking about such an important topic. We sure appreciate your time today. Yeah. And thank you for your um, your willingness to take on this really sensitive and, as you said, um, tender issue. Yes, for sure. All right, my friends, thanks for joining us again for another episode of the Stronger Marriage Connection podcast. We'll see you next time. And remember, it's the small things that create a stronger marriage connection. Take care now. Thanks for joining us today. Hey, do us a favor and take a few minutes to subscribe to our podcast and the Utah Marriage Commission YouTube channel, where you can watch this and every episode of the show. When you hit the like button and leave a comment, your feedback helps us improve the show. And don't forget to share this episode with a friend. You can also follow and connect with us on Instagram at Stronger Marriage Life and on Facebook at Stronger Marriage. Be sure to share with us what topics you want us to explore or what you loved about today's episode. If you want even more resources to improve your relationship connection, visit our website at strongermarriage.org where you'll find free workshops, webinars, relationship surveys, and more. Each episode of Stronger Marriage Connection is hosted and sponsored by the Utah Marriage Commission at Utah State University. And finally, a big thanks to our producers Rex Polanis and Alexis Alcott and the team at Utah State University. And you, our audience, you make this show possible.